Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, on Palm Sunday, just a few days ago, uh, I spoke about Friedrich Nietzsche and especially of his hatred of Christianity. He was the son of a Lutheran pastor, and Nietzsche, of course, knew the Christian faith very well. He certainly understood that the cross of Jesus Christ stands right at the heart of our life and witness. But, of course, this was also Nietzsche's biggest problem, because he hated the cross. He hated everything that it stands for in the Christian life. The way of humility, the way of gentle suffering, the way of personal sacrifice, the consequence of sin and evil. In his mind, in Nietzsche's mind, all of these things are the opposite of what it means to truly live. The cross of Christ for Nietzsche was and is and will always be a negation of life. And so to embrace the cross, he believed, is simply to embrace death. In the most literal sense, the cross represents death, and death for Nietzsche can be nothing good. But of course, Nietzsche is now gone. If he was right about these things, then his life was merely snuffed out, and his last breath was all that he ever will know. If Nietzsche was right, then it will be for us as it was for him. It's all just going to end soon enough. However, if Nietzsche was wrong, if Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, and if Jesus' great power was demonstrated on his cross, then Nietzsche was really wrong. He was wrong in a way that no one wants to be wrong, and his error was a tragedy. Remember, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, St. Paul wrote that the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. <clears throat> Tonight, in this very short homily, I want us to consider the cross. And we're not going to say anywhere near all that can be said about the cross, but I'd like to say uh, a few things. Was it folly? Or was the cross something more? I've got just three simple points to make, and I'd like to begin with this idea that we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, that the cross is power, because this is where Nietzsche and so many others go astray. You see, for Nietzsche, the cross was folly, but for us, as Paul says, the cross truly is power. In John chapter 19, verse 30, which I just read, Jesus uttered his final words from the cross, saying simply, it is finished. And when he said those words, they meant much. Remember, Jesus was God's long-awaited Messiah. He was the one to rescue us from sin and evil. And when he died upon that cross, he was claiming that his work was done. Somehow, Jesus' death did it all. Now, from a worldly perspective, this makes no sense at all. But for us, of course, one of the great mysteries of God is contained in this paradox. That somehow, in the death of God himself, of Jesus, the man on the cross, God's power over sin and death was demonstrated. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 through 15, the Apostle Paul puts it this way. He says, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Now here's a part, at least, of what Paul is saying. God allowed evil to run its awful course. 
And in doing so, evil had its day. Evil did what evil does. Jesus was killed. What this means is that evil has the power to destroy and to kill. But that is all that evil can do. And of course, we know there's more. Because after evil had its day, God raised Jesus up from the dead, proving the limits of death and his own unlimited power at the same time. Evil and death can only kill, but God can bring to life. God can even raise the dead. And in the cross of Jesus Christ and in the resurrection of Christ, God demonstrated his power to do just that. And so on the cross, evil and death were disarmed. Satan was rendered powerless through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. St. Athanasius of Alexandria considers this great mystery, and he suggests that Jesus took a body like our own because all our bodies were liable to the corruption of death. He surrendered, he surrendered his body to death instead of all and offered it to the Father. This he did out of sheer love for us so that in his death all might die and the law of death thereby be abolished because having fulfilled in his body that for which it was appointed, it was thereafter voided of its power for men. This he did that he might turn again to incorruption men who had turned back to corruption and make them alive through death by the appropriation of his body and by the grace of his resurrection. Thus, he would make death to disappear from them as utterly as straw from fire. Jesus gave his life up, and we died with him so that we might be raised with him. And so to repeat the point, the cross is a demonstration of God's power over sin and evil. On the cross, evil and death are simply exhausted. They find their limit. They can only kill, they can only destroy, but God goes so much further than that. God's power over evil and death was demonstrated. Here's my second point. The cross is a demonstration of God's great love, which we do not deserve. John 3.16 says all that really needs to be said here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And in John 15.13, Jesus tells the disciples, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. On the cross, God's love takes the form of forgiveness, but that forgiveness is more than a thought. It becomes flesh in act. It changes our status. God's love is saving action. It is a costly love, and it reconciles. In Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11, St. Paul writes that while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For, why, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. In his love, God has reunited us with himself. Gregory of Nazianzen describes this reconciliation in, in cosmic terms. And I love what he says here. He says, There were at the time all kinds of miracles. God on the cross, the sun darkened, the veil of the temple rent, water and blood flowing from his side, the earth quaking, stones breaking, the dead rising. Who can worthily extol such wonders? But none is to be compared with the miracle of my salvation. Minute drops of blood making the whole world new, working the salvation of all men as the drops of fig juice one by one curdle the milk, reuniting mankind, knitting them together as one. Now for my third point. The cross of Christ 
reveals to us our, sorry, I'm going to start again. It's Good Friday. It would be a really good time to, for, for, to say something funny, um, <laughs> but, that, but I'm not going to do it. Um, sometimes we need that. All right, here's my third point. Now for my third point. The cross of Christ reveals to us our great value in God's eyes. Uh, it is all too easy to speak endlessly of our own sin and evil, and I probably do that too much. It's too easy to dwell on the terrible price paid by Christ for our sins. But if this is all that we consider, then we miss the point entirely. Jesus died for us because he loved us, which means that God has found us worthy of his own love. God loves us. What more could Jesus possibly do to prove this? It's demonstrated for us on the cross. This, I believe, is what Nietzsche failed to see. For Nietzsche, the cross means only suffering and sacrifice, but never does Nietzsche understand the object of love motivating all the sacrifice. God died for us because he loved us. There was a point to the sacrifice. There was a great joy at the end of the sacrifice. God wants us to take up our own crosses because he loves us and because he wants his love to work through us for others. For us, too, there is always a great point to the sacrifice. Humility, self-giving, sacrificial love, these always have an object. We follow Christ because we, like Christ, love those for whom Christ died. And God will help us to love them. God has declared them worthy, just as he has found us worthy. And so let's don't be like Nietzsche. Let's never forget that Jesus died for us and for our salvation. Despite all our sin, God paid the ultimate price for us. And so dying for us, Jesus bestowed on us the most incredible dignity. And this, we should never forget, is very, very good news. We're here tonight to celebrate the cross because it is good news. In Romans chapter 8, verse 32, Paul considers the great gift we are given, explaining that God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, with him, graciously give us all things? God not only loves us, he has made us worthy of his love. And this is a great gift indeed. <clears throat> and so in the words of St. Ambrose of Milan, Jesus suffered affliction for me, he who did not have anything to suffer for himself, setting aside the enjoyment of his divinity, he is afflicted with the annoyance of my weakness. He took on my sadness so that he might bestow on me his joy. And we should add, because he loves us. And so on this Good Friday, let us consider the cross of Christ carefully. Let us not take it for granted. The cross is a great demonstration of God's power. The cross declares God's love, and not just God's love, but our worth. God makes us worthy. To receive his own boundless love, he calls us his own, and we are blessed indeed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.